I'm hoping that my family is well on the way to, to Arkansas. Um, they were getting a late start this morning, so please pray for them as they travel. Well, let's jump in this morning. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, or for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. And then, as always, when we leave this morning, we want to prove ourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. All right, so we're jumping back into this explanation of the tribulation. Um, and we're looking at verses 3 through 28 of chapter 24. So um, it's, a long, it's a long passage. Let's go ahead and read it. We'll go ahead and do that, even though it is long. We'll read it now, and then we'll jump in. In verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you, deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as, not, as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now nor ever will. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ or, or there he is. Do not believe him, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner room, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather." Father, thank you for your word. Help us to handle it accurately today so that we might learn the lessons you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I wanted to give this morning a little visual presentation that might help us to understand what's going on. Um, can you see that okay? Oh, I see it. Can you see it? I can see it. I'm a lot closer than you are, though. All right, so this is from Tim LaHaye and Tommy Ice's chart book, um, charting Bible, Bible prophecy. And I want to point out a couple things to you here. Notice you have the prophets. It says what the prophets saw. And this is in the Valley of the Old Testament. All right. So the picture they're trying to draw for us here is that the prophets are in a valley. And as they look out, they see the peaks of the mountains. And these mountains are the mountain peaks of prophecy, as the title says. So they could see the peaks and they could see these major happenings in, in most of history through the prophetic word that God had given. But there were a couple of valleys that they did not see. And that one is the valley of the church. 
They didn't see the church. The Old Testament prophets knew nothing of this new creature, as Paul calls it, this new man, the church, where both Jew and Gentile would be brought together into one new man. So they knew nothing of that. And secondary, they, they knew nothing of the new heavens and new earth. What they were looking for is this right here. The Old Testament prophets were focused on this, the coming kingdom. Uh, and possibly even the destruction of, of the earth, according to Second Second Peter three. Okay, so as they're looking down through history, through this gift of, of of God giving them prophecy, they saw what God wanted them to see. But there's this mystery, as Paul calls it, and it's the church. Now you say, well, why do you want to show us this? Well, because what Jesus is doing, I believe, he is acting in his capacity as prophet here. He is speaking the word that God is giving him as prophet, and he is not directly, um, a pro, uh, not directly uh, uh, talking about the church per se in, the, in this passage, verses 4 through 28. But he's, or excuse me, verses 4 through 14, okay? Jesus is speaking of the entire uh, history from his uh, first advent back into heaven where he is now appearing in glory until his second advent to earth when the kingdom will come. Is that clear? Am I, am I making myself clear here? Okay. All right. So verses 4 through 14, Jesus is giving an overview of the history uh, from the moment he lifts off and goes back to heaven to the moment he lands again. And so the, um, when he says in verse 14, then the end will come, he's looking from where he is all the way to the end of the tribulation. Okay, are we good? There may be some of you disagree with that. It's okay, there's, a, there's an exit. Um, just joking, just joking. All right. And so when we get to verse 15, verse 15 presents a more detailed picture of the second half of the tribulation period. So when we get to verses 13 and 14, actually you could just look at verses 9 through 14 as not only the history of today, but the picture or the character of what the tribulation is going to be, except when you get to the tribulation, things are amped up. And so think of it like this. You have a snowball at the top of a hill. You've seen the cartoons, right? You have a snowball at the top of the hill uh, and Bugs Bunny pushes the snowball. And the, for those of you kids who don't know who Bugs Bunny is, I'll pray for you. Um, it's the best cartoon ever. All right. So the snowball starts at the top of the hill, very small, but as it rolls downhill, it gathers steam and it gathers more snow and it gets larger and larger and larger, right? And then when it finally gets to the bottom, it hits whatever it's going to hit and it's just massive snow. Jesus and Paul both give us a vivid picture of, of the way this current age in which we live will develop like that snowball going downhill. Things are bad, but guess what? Things are going to get worse and things are going to continue to get worse. Paul says things are going to get even worse towards the end of the age. And so Jesus is giving us this picture of the entire period from his first advent or his first, uh, his departure until his second advent uh, at the end of the tribulation. So within these uh, verses 4 through 14, we have a picture of the history that includes the church, but it doesn't mention the removal of the church as we talked about in Sunday school this morning because the church is not in focus here. All right, now I hope I'm making myself clear. I'm trying really hard. Some, sometimes it gets difficult to ex explain what's going on, especially when you have a limited vocabulary like I do. So anyway, when we look at, at the Olivet Discourse as a whole, people tried to plug it in to something that's called a genre. Okay, everybody remembers in school learning about genres. You have mysteries, you have... Uh, uh, you have uh, murder mysteries, you have romance novels, you have things, different genres of books, different genres of plays, okay? And there's a genre called apocalyptic genre when you're dealing with ancient literature. An apocalyptic genre, uh, I can't even remember all the details about it, but uh, it, it's basically very fanciful, very imaginative writings that try to pass themselves off uh, as prophetic. Okay. 
And uh, most of the time they're written by, or, or they're written under a pseudonym, so the person doesn't even give their actual name. Um, and, and so a lot of people will try to take this portion of Matthew and say this belongs to the apocalyptic genre. And they try to take the book of Revelation and say that belongs to apocalyptic genre. And there's a problem with that. I really reject that outright because there are so many differences between apocalyptic genre and what we find written in the word of God. I personally don't believe there's any apocalyptic genre in scripture because it, it, that, trying to place something in that category really downgrades scripture to a man-made uh, writing, okay? What I believe is going on here is, is more in line with a uh, farewell address. So Jesus here is giving his farewell address to his disciples. It's interesting that he does so because the next night, in, in the chron chronology of this last week of Jesus' life, according to John, the next night he gives what is called the upper room discourse. And in the upper room discourse, there, is, there are a lot of things that overlap with what you see here in the Olivet Discourse. In other words, in the upper room discourse, there are going to be warnings about false teachers. There are going to be uh, warnings about remaining, um, uh, remaining faithful or appeals to remain faithful to the teaching of Christ. There's going to be a prediction of tribulation for the disciples. Uh, and, and there's going to be a, a, a mention of blessings that will come to them in, in the production of fruit in their lives if they remain faithful to Jesus Christ. But a lot of it overlaps. The difference is that what we see here in Matthew is that Jesus is teaching his disciples and really giving a general call to anyone who will listen to warn them of what is to come in the future so that they will believe in him and follow his teaching instead of being, uh, being fooled by these false Christs and false prophets. And so the Olivet Discourse that we're looking at today is a farewell address. I've, I found a paper that I have uh, that I, I don't even remember where I got it, but someone had done a, a paper for probably for a, a journal or something. And um, I, I can't even find the, the, the name of the author. But it's a really good paper, and I want to read to you some of the things that he said about the Olivet Discourse. He said, Jesus prophesied what the future would involve and prepared his disciples and those who would follow in their train to understand and to face future events and difficulties forewarned and forearmed. He prepared them for ongoing faithfulness to Christ, his people, and his commission while they awaited his return. He gave them what they needed to know to face a future fraught with adversity and to carry out a successful mission to the nations. He united predictions of the future with exhortations concerning conduct required of faithful and wise followers. So although this, this uh, message was given directly to the 12, you can see that it, it carries a lot of information that you and I need to know in our present age. And I want to conclude this portion of my introduction by reading a quote to you from Dr. John Walford. Uh, John Walford says, taken as a whole, the opening section ending with Matthew 24, 14, itemizes general signs events and situations which mark the progress of the age and with growing intensity indicate that the end of the age is approaching. So again, he holds that view that what we find here in verses 4 through 14 is dealing with the age that we now live in but will continue to grow worse and worse into the tribulation period. If you recall, when we, when we went through the book of Revelation, we looked at the fact that when we get to Revelation chapter 6 and the seven seals are broken, that there is a great parallel between chapter 6 of Revelation and verses 4 through 14 of Matthew chapter 24. That's because what we find is that escalation of these things that we, that we see Jesus teaching on in verses 4 through 14. 14. Now I can see I'm putting some of you to sleep, so let's, let's move on. I wanted to show you a couple of other things that, that describe for us the character of the age in which we live. 
that Jesus was attempting to teach his disciples in preparation for what was to come. First of all, you can go to John chapter 16. If you will, you can turn there with me, John chapter 16. Now this is part of the Olivet Discourse. And this is dealing with the life of the church that is to be established. He's preparing the disciples to be the leaders of the church here. And in John chapter 16, Jesus says this, these things I have spoken to you. And he had already mentioned in verse eight, beginning in verse 18 of chapter 15, talking about how the world is going to hate them because it hated him first. And so he goes on, these things I've spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. Now look at this. Stop for just a moment and look up here. Look at me. Why do we study Bible prophecy? It's useless. There's no use. Why do we want to talk about the end of the age? Why do we want to do all that? It's just useless stuff, right? Jesus says, I'm, I've, I've spoken these things to you. Why? So that you will not stumble. Understanding, properly understanding Bible prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled helps us to be firmly planted so that when times get rough, we don't stumble. And that's what Jesus is telling his disciples here. He goes on in verse 2, they will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Does that sound familiar? These things they will do, I don't, think he's, I don't think he's necessarily talking about Islam, okay? But it sure, there's a parallel, I think, that we can take from that. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. And so Jesus explains to the disciples that he is doing this or he has taught them this not to frighten them, not to scare the pants off of them, but to prepare them. And so that they will be, as the writer uh, said a few moments ago, forewarned and forearmed. Okay. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Turn there if you will. <clears throat> this was comfort for a troubled church. The church at Thessalonica they're thinking that the, that the tribulation's on them. They're suffering. And they're thinking, hey, the tribulation's here. What, what's going on? And Paul reminds them, and, and um, Mike touched on this, I believe, this morning, when he speaks of, um, well, let's just read what we have here. In verse 3, Paul says, let no one in any way deceive you. Now notice, I, I'm sorry, I keep stopping, I realize that, but notice these continued References to deception, being deceived in the end times. Remember, Paul tells Timothy in, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, I believe it is, where he says, you know, there's coming a time where they're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to want to be deceived. So they're going to go find teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. And there's this continued reminder don't be deceived. There are false prophets. The most dangerous place, and I want you to hear this, the most dangerous place for a Christian today is the Christian bookstore. 95%, and I'm just taking a stab here. It could be more, but I bet it's not less. 95% of, of what's on the books of the Christian bookstore is utter garbage. If I had a dime for every false prophet that's written a book lately in the last 10 years, I'd have a lot of dimes. I don't know how many, but I'd have a bunch. I might just retire. Who knows? So again, back to, back to what he's saying here. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come. That Those words are inserted to clarify what Paul is talking about. It will not come unless the, and I'm going to say this, unless the departure comes first. That's what we talked about this morning. I agree with Michael that what he's speaking of here is his referencing back to 1 Thessalonians talking about the rapture of the church. The departure. We're going to depart and meet the Lord Jesus in the air. And that, that word for apostasy there, for those of you who were not in Sunday school this morning, where were you? But secondly... The Greek word is apostasia, and it literally means departure. That's all it means. 
And so it needs some sort of qualifier with it in most cases to, to uh, allow you to know what, it, what the departure is from. That's terrible English, but anyway. You're departing from something. Uh, Mike, again, made reference this morning to a passage in Acts where they accuse Paul of teaching the Jews to depart from the law of Moses. It's the same word. Okay? So what are we departing from here? Well, he uses the definite article. So there's something that he has taught them in the past that they should know about that he is referencing here. And the, par the departure is found, in, I believe, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's the harpazo, the removal, the snatching away of the people of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I've taken enough time on that. Let's finish reading this, see if I can get through it. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And, and this is a chronological thing, after that, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do, not, do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? There it is again. And you know what resta restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, so that, as, as John will put it, that spirit of Antichrist is already working. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. And listen, with all power and signs and false wonders and with all deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason... God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. I believe what we see today with the, with the fact that you cannot reason with people today. They have been given over, and I'm, this is a general statement. It's not saying every individual person, but the spirit of the age Okay? People have been given over to that debased mind that is not able to reason properly. Romans chapter 1. And you can't, it's, it's, it's that old saying, do not confuse me with the facts. You can present facts upon facts upon facts about the fact that there is no global climate change. But because their worldview is such that they believe a lie, the facts mean nothing. And so God has already begun to send that deluding influence. And when the tribulation begins, when the man of lawlessness is revealed, that deluding influence is going to go into overdrive. And only the Spirit of Almighty God will be able to save those people. Just like today, only the Spirit of the Almighty God can save people. We cannot argue anyone into heaven. All right, I'm taking too long on this. I'm sorry. But this is just some background footage for us to look at as we move into verses 4 through 14. So let's do that. See what we have here. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. Let's stop right there. Verses 3 through 5. Jesus presents to them this warning, a danger of looking for signs. A danger of looking. Why do I say that? Well, verse 3, what are they looking for? Tell us what the sign's going to be. What kind of sign are we looking for? How do we, how, you know, is there some sort of special thing that we need to be watching for to, that's going to come before your return? And Jesus says, you be careful not to be misled by people saying, here's a sign. Except for Jeff Foxworthy. When he says, here's your sign, that's okay. But this is a whole different subject. Okay. He's, he says in verse 5, because there are many who are going to come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. So forewarned, forearmed. There are a lot of false prophets writing a lot of books and, and doing a lot of presentations on television today. And Jesus says, be careful, be on guard, see to it that you are not misled. Don't look for other 
signs. Don't look for miraculous things to happen. Don't look for special revelations from God to give you some sort of message outside of the message he's already given because you can be misled that way. And many Christians are. It's the danger of moving away from the word of God. What does Jesus remind his disciples in John chapters 14 through 16? Abide in my word. Abide in my word. The spirit is going to come. He's going to teach you the things that I can't teach you now. And you give that to others. And he has done that in the form of preaching in times past. And then in scripturating his word and preserving it for us today. And when we leave the bounds of scripture for anything else, you're walking a dangerous path. And Jesus warns his disciples not to do that. Be aware, see to it that you do not do this. Then he gives a a description of the general turbulence of the age in verses 6 through 8. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. And so how many times have you heard over the course of your life, oh, there are earthquakes. See, it's a sign. Jesus is coming soon. And Jesus says, no, it's not a sign that I'm coming soon. Famines are not a sign that I'm coming soon per se, okay, We're not to be looking for those things and say, okay, well, that shows that Jesus is coming soon. That's not his point. As a matter of fact, he says these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Don't be frightened when you see these things happen because he says they must take place. It's uh, the necessary consequences of living in a fallen world is that there are going to be earthquakes and famines and pestilence and death and suffering. Because it's just a product of living in a fallen world. Okay? But he says, don't let it frighten you. We can't walk around in fear. We can't let ISIS and and all these other critters running around frighten us. But we need to be on guard. And we need to be firmly planted in the word of God. And then he follows this with a specific description or a description of specific tribulation for those who are going to follow Christ. Look at verse 9. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Let's stop there. Now, that's a description of tribulation that, is going to come, that, that will come upon the people of God from the disciples onward and will pick up even more steam in the tribulation period. We look around. We have two classes of people who are most hated in the world today. Anybody venture to guess? Christians and Jews, right? The world will hate you. You're going to be hated by all nations because of my name. So specifically, I believe he's targeting those who are believing Jews and believing Gentiles. In other words, today it's going to be called the church. So this is directed towards us. or It's directed to anyone who believes at any time from that point. But it's a good lesson for us. We're, we're going to be hated. Jesus tells his disciples in, in John chapter 15, they hated me first, so don't be surprised when they hate you. And what, it, what is the church in general trying to do today? Make itself palatable to a world that hates Jesus Christ. Os Guinness wrote a great book years ago that I read a, about a year ago called Prophetic Untimeliness. And he takes on this idea that, that has infiltrated the church uh, as a whole that we have to continue reinventing ourselves to be palatable or to be attractive to the world. Because what he, his point is that when you do that, you become like the world and you, you, aren't, uh, you aren't what the church is to be. You, you're not light in a dark world. You become like darkness, 
Instead, the church ought to find in the scripture what the church is to do and stick with that regardless of what the culture does. And as we do that, what happens? If I had a candle up here right now and I had it lit, you'd see it and you'd think, oh, a candle, very nice. But if we turn the lights out, that candle is going to take center stage, right? That's what the church is supposed to be, is it not? A light in a dark world. And when we try to make ourselves look like the world to be attractive to the world, we've just hidden our lampstand under a bushel. So what we need to do is cling to the word of God, stand up loudly and humbly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and the only way of salvation, whether it means our heads, our jobs, our fortunes, or whatever. That's when we become prophetic in this dark world. Not pathetic, prophetic. He also expresses this idea of divine rescue in verse 13. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. There's, this is a verse that, that lordship salvation people are going to cling to. You have to endure to the end. Well, what is he talking about when he says saved? Is he speaking of spiritual salvation or is he speaking of a physical rescue? Rev, uh, Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be, be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved just it is, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove the ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I, when I take their sins away. So is he talking about a physical deliverance or a spiritual deliverance? And the answer is yes. He's talking about both. He's not saying that you have to endure to have your sins forgiven. He is saying that at the end of the tribulation, there's going to be one third of Israel remaining. That's it. The, the two thirds are going to be wiped out. And that one third that is remaining, or that, that is going to comprise the group that will cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As Jesus returns, that group will experience the physical deliverance as well as the spiritual forgiveness of sin. They will have exercised faith and Jesus will deliver them from their attackers. All right? So this is speaking of the end of the tribulation period. Then in verse 14, he speaks of the spreading of the word of God. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. When will the end come? Verse 30, that the sign... Uh, this, this tells when the end will come, after the preaching of the gospel to all nations. But the sign is delivered in verse 30. We'll get to that later. I just thought I'd bring that up. So what is he talking about here? Well, in Mark chapter 13, Mark is dealing with the, the same discourse that Jesus is giving. And in Mark 13, verse 10, Mark says this, the gospel must be first preached to all the nations. And he just leaves it at that. Doesn't mention the gospel of the kingdom. Now, I believe what we see here is that Jesus has been preaching the gospel of the kingdom, which is repent, Israel, for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. We don't say that today. That's not the exact same terminology used to present the gospel today. The gospel we present today, we can sum it up like this. We're sinners in the hands of an angry God. That God has, has uh, uh, provided the way of salvation through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And if you believe in him, you will escape the wrath that is to come, the judgment that is to come. When is that judgment coming? It's coming at the end of the age. It's coming at the end. Uh, the ultimate judgment is coming at the end of the millennial kingdom. When all those who've rejected Christ will be ultimately cast into the lake of fire. 
So right now we're preaching that Jesus is coming back and he's going to establish his kingdom. And at that time, those who have believed in him will enter into the kingdom. Those who have not will not be part of the kingdom. As a matter of fact, back it up a little bit more. We're saying that, that before that judgment comes, Jesus Christ is going to call to himself all those who have put their faith in him. And we're going to escape this period of judgment called the tribulation. And we will rule and reign with him in the kingdom. So the gospel that we're preaching, we, and Walverd said it also, that, that the gospel message is going out farther and farther. Pro, part of the problem is that we are making more and more effort to get, get the gospel out around the world, but much of that gospel is not the gospel at all. It's a works-based gospel, much of it. But the effort's being made. I'll just leave it at that. And so the gospel is being preached, but is it going to be preached to the whole world before Jesus comes? Yes, but by whom? Well, we'd have to go to the book of Revelation for that. And in Revelation 7, verses 4 through 11, we see 144,000 witnesses who will be chosen by God to share the gospel at that time. But not only that. There is coming a time in Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 and following, Revelation chapter 14, um, I, can't re I, be I, I believe it's uh, Revelation 14, where there is an angel who goes out and proclaims the everlasting gospel to the whole world. And then, following that, Jesus returns. So we are to preach the gospel. That's why Jesus told his disciples to make disciples. You can't make disciples without sharing the gospel. And we are to do that until he removes us from this earth. But the fulfillment of the, the spreading of the gospel throughout the whole earth will not take place, I believe, until that angel comes and does it in a miraculous way that cannot be done uh, by humans. All right, so that's verses 4 through 14. That gives us a general overview to the time of the end of the tribulation. Now Jesus digs in and gets more detailed into the second half of the tribulation period, beginning in verse 15. Notice in verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. The abomination of desolation is mentioned in, in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 11, and Daniel chapter 12. Now, Daniel chapter 9 is the best place to go to get a, a broad view of what we find here in Matthew chapter 24 and also uh, in Revelation. We're getting short on time this morning, so I just simply want to, to go back and, well, you know what? We need to go ahead and do that. So go to Daniel chapter 9, if you will. In Daniel chapter 9, and you're going to have to stick with me so we can make it through this real quick. Daniel receives this message. He says, 70 weeks have been decreed. Now remember, when it re references weeks here, it means years, okay? So it's 70 weeks of years. So 490 years. 70 weeks of years have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So that gives you a list of what are these, uh, what are, what is these uh, 70 weeks of years, what are they, what's their purpose? Well, he just gave them to us right there. Verse 25, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. All total, um, well, yeah, um, 79 weeks of years have been fulfilled, okay? After 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the Prince, that's not right. Don't ever get me doing math in public. Anything above one plus one, I start getting lost. So anyway, then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will, will be destroyed 
um, will, will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined, and he will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wings of abomination will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Okay? All right. So there is one week remaining in this prophecy that, that was given to Daniel. There's seven years. That's what we call the tribulation period. And he has just described the tribulation period. It begins with the covenant that this lawless one, the Antichrist, as we call him, makes with Israel. So he makes a covenant. It says he makes a firm covenant with the people. But in the middle of that covenant... Seven years. In the middle of that seven years, about three and a half years, he breaks the covenant. He causes the temple sacrifices to cease and he desecrates or, or, or uh, uh, makes desolate the temple by setting up abominations within the temple. All right? So that is the sign for Israel that they know they better run and not walk to the nearest exit, as Jesus says in verses 16 through 20. You need to get out of town when you see this happening because there's going to be tribulation like the world has never... It's going to make Hitler and the Nazis look like romper room. And for you young people, you'll just have to ask your parents what romper room is, okay? All right? So this is going to be a tribulation period that has never been seen, and Jesus says it will never be seen again. All right. Now, in Daniel chapter 11, Daniel reveals something that is much more closer to his time than the end of the age. And that is the fact that Antiochus Epiphanes is going to bring his army against Israel. And because he had been defeated by the Egyptians, he takes out his wrath upon Israel. And he comes into Israel and he desecrates the temple. By Some say he sacrificed a pig, uh, but regardless, he established a, a, uh, a, 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 an altar to Zeus in the temple of God. And it made the temple desolate, meaning that no, no one would come to the temple any longer. It was abandoned. All right. And so in verse 33 of chapter or verse 31, it says forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress and do away with the regular sacrifice. And they will set up the abomination of desolation. So it's something that's going to be set up. We go over to the book of Revelation and we find that at some point in the book of Revelation or, or in that period, there's going to be an idol made of the Antichrist and people will be forced to worship him. Now, I can't prove it, but I believe that that idol is the abomination of desolation. I believe it's going to be set up in the temple. As a matter of fact, we just read in 2 Thessalonians that this man of lawlessness is going to set himself in the temple and proclaim himself to be God. So it's probably a both-and situation here that at a point he's going to set uh, himself in the temple on his own throne where God's place should be, declare himself God, and then put the uh, idol in there uh, for people to come and worship. So Jesus says, and all this, I can't say 100% that that's exactly what's going to happen. That's just from what I read in scripture. I believe that's how it's going to play itself out. And so Jesus says, when you see this happening, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in this house. Whoever's in the field must not turn back to get his cloak, but woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on Sabbath. So he's saying that you need to hit the, the nearest exit and get out of town and don't go back and get your stuff. And if you're pregnant, God bless you because it's going to be difficult for you. If it's in the winter, it's going to be hard traveling. If it's on a Sabbath, Lord knows people are going to condemn you for leaving town and walking too far on the Sabbath day. All these things are going to make it more difficult for them to hightail it out of town. Then beginning in verse 21, he describes the great tribulation's definite termination. He says, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short 
short. Now, what does he mean there? Is it going to be three and a half years or is it not going to be three and a half years? It's going to be a three and a half years. What he means by cut short is that it's going to be definitely terminated because if it's not terminated, he says no life on earth will survive. And that's when all Israel will be rescued, both spiritually and physically, those who remain. Then again, he brings back this idea of false messiahs, the presence of false messiahs versus the appearance of the true messiah. Look at verse 23. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders. There it is again. They're going to be endued with power to do great signs and wonders to mislead people. And it's going to be so convincing that he says that they'll possibly even be able to mislead the elect if you're not on guard. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner room, do not believe him. In other words, you have these people who are promoting this false Messiah and they're saying, hey, he's out there in the wilderness. Does that remind you of John the Baptist? You've got to go out and see him. Or he's in this upper room. Does it remind you of Jesus being in the upper room with his disciples? These are kind of secret meetings that you have to be invited to or that you have to be pointed to. But Jesus says, you know what? The, son, the return of the Son of Man is not going to be like that you're not going to need anybody to point it out to you. Because he says in verse 27, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. You're not going to have to have somebody say, hey, he's over there or he's in there. He's going to say, it's going to be unmistakable. I woke up this morning about, I'd say it's about five o'clock. I thought I heard thunder. But then I rolled over in bed and I'm looking at my window and all of a sudden I saw a flash of lightning. I'm in my house. I see a flash of lightning from outside. You, can, you can't miss it. That's the way the coming of the Son of Man is going to be. No one's going to miss it. As a matter of fact, I love the way J. Vernon McGee describes it. It's going to be a 24-hour processional around the world as Jesus returns in such a manner that he's got his armies of heaven following behind him on white horses and he's coming through the clouds and he makes this whole processional around the entire world before he lands on the Mount of Olives. Now, is that the way it's going to happen? I have no idea. But what I do know is Jesus said it's going to be unmistakable. You're not going to need anybody to identify it for you. And those who have suppressed the truth and unrighteousness and rebelled against Jesus Christ time and time again are going to know who it is. And they're going to they're gonna wish that they'd made a different decision. Verse 28, I'll end with this. Wherever the corpse is, there the vulture will gather. Now, once again, you ask any commentator, you ask five commentators, you get five different opinions on this verse. So I'm just going to give you a couple that it might be. One is that when Jesus returns, his enemies are going to be destroyed and where, where their corpses are, the vultures are going to come eat the flesh. That's, that's described in the book of Revelation. So it very well could be that. However, I do like the way, I believe it was uh, uh, Dr. Toussaint describes it like this. The corpse is referring to Israel's spiritual corpse. That uh, like a, 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 a dead body attracts the carrion birds to eat the flesh, the dead spiritual corpse of Israel attracts the false prophets and the false messiahs. I don't know which one it is or if it's one of the other 20 I read. I don't know. But uh, I think either, I think the two best are that this is referring to when Jesus returns and his enemies are destroyed or what the way Dr. Toussaint says it, that, that Israel is a spiritual corpse and it has attracted these false Christs and false false prophets. So anyway, all right. So what do we see? Let's just close with this. What do we see? What are the imperatives? What are the things that we need to be doing uh, as we look at this? Now, what we're going to look at, they're not all actual imperatives grammarily in, in this passage, but I'm going to use them that way. Okay. 
What do we need to be doing? Well, first of all, we do not, I, I put mislead on there, didn't I? We're not to be misled by supposed signs, okay? We're not to, uh, we're not to be misled by people who say they speak for God, uh, have some special message from him, and be led away from the purity of the word of God. All right? Number two. We don't need to be disturbed what, by what may come. We're all in the same boat. We look around at our nation. We hate what we see going on. We look at this upcoming election. We don't know which way it's going to go. Um, we know that one way is going to be bad and the other way might be bad also. We just don't know. Uh, you know, we see the people who are trying to destroy our culture, our heritage, uh, forcing, uh, forcing us to, to accept beliefs that are contrary to the word of God. In other words, your, your daughters have to allow a man to come into the bathroom with them. Now, thank God Texas has told uh, D.C. where to get off, and that's great, and I hope they hold, hold firm to that. And we just see all of this stuff going on. And guess what? Jesus said, don't let it shock you, because I've told you beforehand. You need to be firmly grounded in the word of God and believe on the promises that are given to us. We need to, according to verse 12, it says that many's love will grow cold. Well, guess what? Just because you're a Christian, that automatically means that your love can't grow cold, right? <clears throat> Wrong answer. We're just sinners saved by grace. We're still dealing with that old sin nature. We have the new man in us, and there's a constant battle between the new man and the old sin nature. And we must guard against allowing our love for others and our love for God growing cold. We need to endure hardships, according to verse 13. In 2 Timothy 2, 3, uh, uh, Paul tells Timothy to endure hardships with me. Matter of fact, uh, um, James says, hey, count it all joy, my brothers, when you uh, f are faced with various trials, various tribulations. It's good for us. Christian and I work out together uh, in, in the garage, lifting weights. And uh, boy, Friday, man, I just worked. We just worked so hard lifting the heavy. Well, for most of you, it wouldn't be heavy, okay? But for me, it was heavy. And for him, it was heavy. And we're just lifting as much as our bodies will let us and, 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 oh, you just say, why you do that? Well, it's to make us stronger. It's, to, it's supposed to make your bones stronger even. You know, it's supposed to be good for you, make you stronger. Well, in the same way, the trying of our faith produces endurance. And endurance produces, uh, I can't even remember now. But anyway, it escapes my mind. Sorry. But uh, we're, we're to rejoice that we're being placed in these trials, knowing that we're growing in Christ. Number five, we're to continually preach the gospel. Guys, you and I need to be, get more bold. You know, I love Dan. Dan's one of the most bold guys I've seen when, when sharing the gospel, and I love it. And I'm embarrassed by it. Not that he does it in front of me, but that I don't do it in front of him. Believe it or not, I, when it comes to some things, I'm kind of shy. And that's one of those things. I'm, I'm just shy about starting that conversation with somebody. But you and I, time is growing short. People need to hear the message. And you and I are the only ones who have the truth. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe I said that out loud. I am such a bigot and, and closed-minded. Sorry about that. Finally, according to verse 25, we need to remember what the Word teaches. Behold, I have told you in advance. We need to remember what the word teaches and be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. If you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus, let me tell you, he's returning soon. And first, it's going to begin with the removal of his church. And Lord have mercy on you after that. Things get really bad. And if you've not put your faith in Jesus Christ at that moment, you have some really hard times coming and there's no guarantee that you'll be able to put your faith in Christ after that. Scripture tells us that we're a product of one man and one woman, Adam and Eve. And because of them, sin entered into the world and our very nature is sin. We cannot change our nature. Only God can. 
Therefore, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life, died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, rose again on the third day, and now stands offering to you a free gift of salvation if you will just put your trust in him. If you will do that today, Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that we have handled it correctly today. May you bless it for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen.